are going up as I speak. We're also live on YouTube. And so we're so glad you're here and a lot of love and preparation has drawn into this, this um, program today. So we'll let everyone get a chance to come in. Great. It's so fun to see the numbers going up. It's like stand, we're standing at the virtual doorway. <laughs> so just give everybody just a minute or two. Okay. That looks like a number that's settling in. Again, I'm Amy Lewis Hoffland. I'm the Senior Director at the Crow Museum of Asian Art. I want to thank you and welcome you to this global classroom that connects today Japan, Paris, New York, Dallas, and beyond. And uh, we're just so honored by your presence. And for the next hour and a half, you can imagine that you have this opportunity uh, you don't have to travel by plane overnight to go to Japan. You don't have to fly to New York, although both of these things would be perfectly fun and lovely. Um, all you have to do is be here in this virtual window, and we're literally going to visit the studios of three tremendous artists. We're going to be with them in, the, in their space. Um, we're so grateful for this intimate um, connection and this window into the work that is part of an exhibition. The exhibition that we celebrate today and throughout this year is Born of Fire, and it is contemporary Japanese women ceramic artists. And there's so much breakthrough um, in this title and in this project, and I'm very proud to represent the Crow Museum, which is presenting the collection of Jeffrey and Carol Horvitz, who are here with us on our panel today. And um, this project also is the great collaboration of uh, the Joan B. Mervis Limited Gallery in New York City, longtime friend of the Crow Museum and a beautiful partner um, in our exploration of Japanese uh, ceramics and contemporary art. Joan is one of my first visits when I go to Asia Week, and I've had uh, such delightful um, experiences in her gallery. So Joan, we're glad you're here and thank you for this beautiful partnership. We're also um, standing with our friends at the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth, which is an organization that's about 40 years old and um, founded by um, the late Neil McFarland, a collector of Daruma that came into the Crow Museum. So we're really grateful for our friends at the Japan America Society. And uh, this is a moment to meet these artists. And I just um, encourage you to lean into the opportunity to connect. Um, we are joined by a tremendous panel um, of a lot of people that have put in their heart to this, this moment to be together. And we want you to connect with us in the chat. We want you to ask questions. And we want you to express your curiosity around um, why these works of art are in Dallas and why Jeffrey and Carol um, care so passionately about supporting the careers of women artists from Japan. And so really do um, feel as if you're warmly welcomed into our virtual space. And um, I've been thinking about the 14 works of art um, that are in this exhibition. And this exhibition is at the Crow Museum. We have a lot of you joining us virtually, so you may not have been there. It is in the Dallas Arts District. Um, it has been there for almost 23 years, and it is a museum that celebrates the traditional works in the Crow family's collection. Um, but it also goes to daring edges and looks at what are the conversations, what are the um, works that are being created, what are the new art histories um, as it relates to art from Japan, China, Korea, Southeast Asia, South Asia. And so this exhibition is a perfect match to our mission and vision for Dallas. We recently merged with the University of Texas at Dallas, and so we're working on a a bright future for the rest of history, as far as I'm concerned. Um, with the university, we're building a second museum um, in Richardson, Texas, which is 15 miles away from our 
first museum. So we'll have two locations. And Jeffrey and Carol, I hope this is a toast to many future projects. We're incredibly grateful for your support to our museum and helping Dallas and the region um, be culturally versed and informed in, in a heartfelt way um, around um, what is our story? What is Dallas and North Texas? What are we going to say and share and, and, and love about Asian art? So thank you. Um, I also want to share that as I looked across these 14 works, which have been on display in the Crow Museum since I believe early January, Jacqueline might correct me there, um, but in this incarnation, we've had several wonderful shows with the Horvitz collection. Um, I was thinking about this particular installation and you'll see as we journey through the brilliant um, works of these artists, that there are so many beautiful, sensitive, um, sensible uh, references to nature and particularly to the ocean. There's water and of course water and fire and earth come together in ceramics. It's a beautiful trifecta and air, I guess it's four. Um, and so I chose a poem to share with you and I'm going to place it into the chat so that you all will have it there as well. I'm going to read it just to kindle um, a little joy. It's called The Hermit Crab. And I chose this after really kind of looking through the works that we'll celebrate today and the artists and what they're doing in the world. This is Mary Oliver, who is a beloved poet um, of mine, great American poet. So this is the hermit crab. Once I looked inside the darkness of a shell folded like a pastry, and there was a fancy face or almost a face. It turned away and frisked upon its brawny forearms so quickly against the light and my looking in. I scarcely had time to see it gleaming under the pure white roof of old calcium. When I set it down, it hurried along the tide line of the sea, which was slashing along as usual, shouting and hissing toward the future, turning its back with every tide on the past, leaving the shore littered every morning with more ornaments of death. What a pearly rubble from which to choose a house like a white flower. And what a rebellion to leap into it and hold on connecting everything, the past to the future, which is of course a miracle, which is the only argument there is against the sea. The past to the future, which is of course the miracle, which is the only argument there is against the sea. So as I turn it over to our brilliant curator, Dr. Jacqueline Chow, and this is where we are, we're bringing the past to the future um, in these, daring, innovative artists um, from Japan who are really breaking through a long tradition um, with their own voices. And so they're truly born of fire. I'm so grateful to turn the mic over to Jacqueline Chow. And I'm also very thankful for Caroline Kim, who is in our production booth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, for such wonderfully warm welcome and remarks. I am very much appreciative of all of your support. Um, for this exhibition and this program here tonight. So thank you for being here. Um, my name is Jacqueline Chow and I serve as Senior Curator of Asian Art for the Crow Museum of Asian Art of the University of Texas at Dallas. I am pleased to welcome and introduce our special guests in today's conversation, highlighting the rich contributions of Japanese female ceramic artists. This conversation is on the occasion and in celebration of the Crow Museum's current exhibition, Born of Fire, Contemporary Japanese Women Ceramic Artists, on view now through January, 2022. I am honored that we are joined today by three of the artists whose works are featured in the exhibition in alphabetical order. They are Fujikasa Satoku, Fudamura Yoshimi, and Hayashi Kaku. Now move to the first slide. Next slide. Perfect. 
Fujikasa Satoku studies ceramics at Tokyo University of the Arts and has received international acclaim for her incredibly dynamic sculptures created from shigaraki clay. Each of her pieces are created using what has become her signature technique of kneading clay into coils, then hand building the forms, which often requires several months to complete. Inspired by the natural world, her works embody forces of vitality. For her series of such works here, including this piece here, Seraphim, currently on view at the Crow Museum, she was strongly influenced by the ever-changing and undulating walls of Antelope Canyon in Arizona. Next slide. Born in Nagoya, Furumori Ushimi studied at the School of Ceramic Art in Sito uh, from 1979 to 1982 and is a graduate of the Centre Artisanal de l'Ecole du Père in Paris. She has lived and worked in France since 1986. Using a blend of stoneware clays and porcelains, she creates unique sculptural forms that reflect the power of nature and the materiality of her medium, the earth. Her works showcase organic, sculpt, uh, textures, organic textures and are reminiscent of flora and fauna, as well as the volcanic and the geological, as seen here with her piece Basque, currently also on view at the Crow. Next slide. Hayashi Kaku graduated from Tokyo University of the Arts and has since become one of the leading female ceramicists in Japan. In 1993, she was awarded a, an Asahi Ceramic Art Exhibition Grand Prize, followed by the Japan Contemporary Arts and Crafts Grand Prize in 1997, which she and she became a counselor of the Japan Contemporary Arts and Crafts Association in, tw in 2016, for which she now serves as a supervisor. She is currently Professor Emerita of Bonsai University of Art. She creates large scale sculptures using kantaro, a clay infused with the volcanic glass mineral substance discovered in 2007 that is now patent protected and widely used in the field. Her works reflect nature, the universe, and the cycles of life and death. Perfect. I'm also delighted to welcome and introduce Carol and Jeffrey Horvitz to tonight's panel, without whom our Born of Fire exhibition would not have been possible. Carol and Jeffrey's important encyclopedic collection of over a thousand works is the largest public or private of modern and contemporary Japanese ceramics outside of Japan. What began as a conversation on creating a show focused on highlighting contemporary Japanese women ceramic artists has become a reality thanks to your wonderful collection. Thank you both again for your tremendous passion, generosity and support. And I'm also pleased to welcome and introduce Joan Mervis to the panel. Joan is an expert and major dealer in Japanese art, specializing in ceramics, ukiyo-e prints, and paintings for over, the past, for over the past 40 years. In the area of modern and contemporary Japanese ceramic art in the West, she has been the pioneering spirit and force behind this burgeoning field. She has organized and mounted over 80 exhibitions of Japanese modern and contemporary uh, ceramics at her New York gallery and also at international art fairs. Widely published and a highly respected specialist in the field, she has advised and built collections for many museums and private collectors. Finally, I am very pleased to also introduce our wonderful Japanese language translator for this program, Tomo Yoshizawa. Tomo Yoshizawa is a cultural translator, a term was coined by her colleague um, and ended up being very, to describe very nicely what she does actually quite accurately, a cultural translator. Um, she was born to a family of craftsmen. Her mother is a weaver and her father is a Koto music instrument craftsman. Her grandfather is Muhemiro Yuikiso, the first designated living national treasure in the field of Sumuji Ponji silk weaving. She now writes and translates mainly in the field of Japanese crafts and culture, bridging cultures of different countries, generations, and societies. For today's program, we will begin first with a conversation that will also include presentations of images that have been prepared by all of our panelists to provide in for everyone with more background information. And following this, we will have an open uh, audience Q&A. Uh, we encourage everyone watching, if you have any questions or comments, to please share them in the chat Q&A at any time, and we'll be happy to answer them after the conversation. So to kick off our artist conversation, I would love to begin my first question to Joan. Um, 
It was actually at your suggestion that these three leading women artists were selected for tonight's panel discussion. I would love to hear your thoughts on why you thought to bring these three particular artists together tonight. Oh, oh let's turn on. You might be muted. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you. It's, it's an honor and quite a privilege to be here with you tonight. And I want to thank you and everyone at The Crow for making this um, uh, process a reality and uh, bringing these incredible ladies to our screens tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Um, as some of you who are here with us tonight may know, we did another program back in April with three other artists, Matsuda Yuriko, Katsumata Cheko, and Fukumoto Fuku, um, who represented three generations of uh, Japanese clay artistry. Uh, one who had been taught by the progenitor of the whole movement, Tomimoto, another who was a recently appointed PhD, and another who was a part-time resident of Kyoto and Paris. So for tonight, I thought we would bring three very different women to join us here, as they represent very different paths from what was discussed last time. Uh, and again, I'm going to go in the order of how I actually met these ladies. So the first is Futamura Yoshimi, who I have known since I met in Paris at the time of the very uh, well-attended Soaring Voices show when it arrived in Paris at the Musée National de Ceramique in Sèvres. Uh, when I opened my gallery in 2007, having been a private dealer for many decades, finally I had space and I was able to do solo shows for the artists and I had space to have works by major sculptors such as Futamura. So the first work I had by her was immediately snapped up by the Yale University Art Gallery. And the next year, the next work by the Brooklyn Museum uh, and followed by the museum, uh, the New Orleans Museum of Art. Um, to date, I've sold over 70%, uh, 70 works by her. And uh, this has brought us to a fine level of friendship as my husband and I also spend quite a bit of time in Paris. Hayashi Kaku, it came to me uh, also through Soaring Voices. I saw her work uh, there. I actually attended that show at seven of its 11 venues, including the one in Paris and two in Japan. And I adored her work. However, at that time, she was a very busy academic and I really didn't have the right introduction. I'm gonna get into that a bit later, how important an introduction is and which person you choose to use as your agent to effectuate a con connection. However, with her retirement, she had more time for people like myself. And in 2019, I was fortunate enough to bring a group of very avid collectors that included Jeffrey and Carol to her home north of Tokyo. And now I can actually say I will be having her first solo show outside of Japan in my gallery next year. And uh, the most uh, junior and recent addition to my stable of artists is the fantastic Fujikasa Satoko. Uh, I first saw her work as small little illustrations in competitive catalogs while she was still a graduate student. And I was fascinated by her work, but I really had no idea by looking at a one inch by two inch photo in a catalog of 500 pieces, uh, really what the artistry was. So uh, suddenly I am taking another group to Japan and this is in 2011, but let me first state the picture you're looking at at the left is her graduation piece from, uh, uh, from her university. Uh, Tokyo Geijutsu Daigaku, which is now part of the permanent collection at the Ibaragi Ceramic Art Museum and was purchased or acquired by probably the leading expert in Japan on modern clay, Kaneko Kenji. And we move to the next slide. So 
here you have a sense of, of what her works looked at, looked like and what they started with, with the New Orleans example at the top, a very recent work that was acquired by the Musée Guimet. I love it for Fujikasa. Um, when Fujikasa, I'm sorry, when Futamura's work comes to New York and now I have to ship it back to Paris again. And you have the piece at the Asian Art Museum and La Don de Felt. But actually I wanna, um, in talking about this with Fujikasa, with, with Futamura, i sorry, I keep messing that up. Um, why is her work different from that with uh, Fujikasa or that of Futa, uh, that of Ihashi. Well, her materials are obviously different. Her training is different. She started off as a student uh, at the Seto Ceramic Research Center under a pupil of Tomi Molto. And, but she is born in, in Nagoya, but ended up residing in, in France, which changed her perspective. Uh, and at the bottom uh, slide, you can see an exhibition that she did in the south of France. One of the other joys of becoming friends with these artists is that you end up on a perpetual uh, tour machine where you're going to one exhibition in one part of the world or another to see their fantastic works being featured by other galleries and museums. Next slide, please. Here you have the works of Hayashi Kaku. Uh, at the bottom right, uh, this is an installation from the Soaring Voices I mentioned before, and you can see her work is more monochromatic and, and very elegant, but not nearly the fiery palette of the work from the Horvitz collection or the work at the top with her new Ocean series that we're about to hear more. She is a graduate of Tokyo Geijutsu Dainaku and was a pupil under Fujimoto Nodo, who founded the department from Tomimoto. So in a sense, she is artistic uh, uh, royalty, having come from a direct line of ceramics at the top, at the, ter at the middle of the 20th century. And next slide. With Fujikasa Satoko, also a pupil at Tokyo Geijutsu Dainaku, you have someone who entered the ceramics department directly from the Department of Sculpture. Uh, so here you have a woman who is really almost obsessed with forms in motion. And clay is her medium, but I would argue in her case, she is not a ceramicist at all. And she's defying her medium in her approach to swirling forms and her, even how it's installed. What you're seeing at the left is an installation at the Hagi Uragami Museum, where she was received a commission to do a piece for a tea house. It's a very modern interpretation of a tea house, but yeah, and the piece of course would only be seen from one position. But I want you, the audience, to see how extraordinary this work is when seen 360 degrees. Next. And here you have Fujikasa and how um, well received she is, which I started to tell you before. The lower right hand corner was when I first encountered her work from having seen her work only in book form in illustration. I was with the collectors, including Carol and Jeffrey in 2011, and we were escorted into this exhibition of a new discovery, new young up and coming talent who had just won this exhibition at the museum as a prize. Uh, we opened the doors and everyone screamed and everyone says, is it for sale? I wanna buy it. And we basically bought out the show. And you can see in the center slide on the right, the same piece that you're looking at at the left which if you're lucky enough to have visited the Met in the last 10 years, you've seen it on permanent installation on the balcony with uh, the wonderful collectors, Allison Halsey North, who facilitated and promoted the acquisition when uh, Fujikasa was just a young artist. And perhaps the attention of so many museums that have acquired her work has brought her to the attention in Japan where she won this amazing prize at Takash, a very prestigious prize at Takashimaya department store. And you can see how her work has been blown up in these large photographs that were like being in the uh, Saks Fifth Avenue windows on Fifth Avenue at Takashimaya in uh, Kyobashi. Next slide. But how are these women's works similar? 
and another reason I picked these three. All three are highly focused on nature imagery, and you're going to hear more from them themselves. And nature is, of course, a constant in Japanese culture and a source of inspiration for Japanese artists of every ilk. But with these three women, it's, it's omnipresent in their work and it pervades not only their work, but their philosophies. Also, all three women are sculptors. Uh, there's nothing functional about these work. These stand alone as inspirational forms and show their individual focus, but at the same time, their reverence for nature. Also, all three women are focused on three dimension and seeing things in the round, and you see this most beautifully in all three works. All three are compelled to risk new and ever creative forms and ever creative techniques. All three are insightful and I find inspirational. So I hope you enjoy hearing from these women as we move forward in this wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joan. And what a rousing tour of this incredible experience of having to meet all these artists and just that experience of opening the doors to like Fujikasa's exhibition <laughs> and just being totally blown away. I can only imagine um, how amazing that was to experience. Um, my next question is for Hayashi Sensei. Um, as the senior artist with us here tonight and a former student of the Living National Treasure Fujimoto Nodo at the Uni Tokyo University of the Arts, can you give us some insights into what it was like as a female student in the 1970s? And furthermore, while as a professor at Bonsai University, how has that situation evolved and changed for women artists? はい、こんにちは。林です。えー、私は1970年代にあの、まあ、東京芸大で陶芸を学びました。で、藤本農道先生の他に田村浩一先生、そしてはまあ浅野先生という、まあ、ある意味ゴールデン時代っていうふうに、まあ、よく呼ばれます。その時代に学びました。I was fortunate to have been able to learn from such legends like Fujimoto Nodo, Tamura Koichi, Asano Akira in the late 70s, that golden era at the Tokyo University of the Arts. Fujimoto Sen Sei to have been a long time with him, but I was able to learn from the traditional work of 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 the t r a d そしてあの藤本先生もジャンルをご,ご自身あの変えて人間国宝になっていく経歴を持っているんですが私にまあ好きなように作ったらいいと背中を押してくださりそれがきっかけでその後浅井峠のグランプリを取りました学生時代には先生のスケッチの多さに触発されて、まあ、100枚描けばなんとかなるという繰り返しを描きオリジナルを作り出す苦しみの大事さを教わりました First, I'd like to talk about、um, Fujimoto Nodo Sensei, which I had a long time relationship with. When I made a shift in my creation from traditional functional objects to art pieces, the Tokyo University of Arts only offered a course for traditional pottery making. But Fujimoto Sensei encouraged me to make objects that I felt passionate towards, which led to my winning the Asahi Ceramic Art Exhibition Grand Prix. Um, Fujimoto Sensei himself gained more recognition after he changed the direction of his works in his 30s and became a designated holder of important intangible culture, cultural property after.、Uh, he drew many sketches and that inspired me to do the same. I used to tell myself, if I drew 100 sketches, then I'll be able to create anything. I engaged myself in the repetitive practice of sketching, which taught me the importance of going through the pain before giving birth to something original. 1963年の,、まあの頃、まあ、東京芸術大学の工芸科の中に、まあ、陶芸っていうものが専攻が始まりますそれまでの陶芸の弟子入り制ではなくてあの学ぶのが、まあ、大学で学ぶことができるっていう時代に入っていきました、まあ、ある意味女性が、まあ、公平に公正にあの学ぶ場と
あの機会を得ることができるようになりましたで女性陶芸家はすでに先輩方の中にも多く存在しておりましたが、えー、小池翔子さん小川真知子さんなどの活躍はされておりました大学では絵画彫刻歴史それから生物美術解剖学それからまあ絵画の科学技法そして漆とか金属染めなどの工芸全般を体験しながら陶芸の専攻を一緒に学んでいく教育プロセスでした。Thanks to the opening of the pottery major within the crafts section in the university in 1963, clay art became subject we could learn in school, not by apprenticeship. This also granted women equal access to education and opportunities. Many female clay artists were active when I joined the university. Um, like、uh, Koike Shoko and Ogawa Machiko, to name a couple. The education program allowed the students to explore a range of subjects holistically, which included painting, sculpting, history, and natural science, and also anatomy and art, scientific study of painting methods, along with a wide range of crafts fields, including metal, urushi, lacquer, ceramics, and textiles. We could specialize in clay art after exploring these fields. Those are えー、1999年にあの新しい文政芸術大学の設立をするということでその設立委員会になりましたで陶芸を学問の世界に位置づける方向性をあの決めましたで基本、まあ、基礎的な土とか釉薬それから釜の構造とか全く何もないゼロ,ゼロのところから大学をつる作ることに全勢力をかけ傾けましたえー、女性の立場が、まあ、学ぶ場が大学っていうことで、まあ、弟子入りではない教育機関で、あの、陶芸を学ぶことが、うん、できるようになりましたが、えー、今回のこのインタビューを、あの、機会に、女性の作家の現状のリサーチを少ししてみました。で、日展、現代工芸、まあ、伝統工芸といろいろな工芸の、まあ、関数、組織が日本ではありますが、えー、理事っていう、まあ、いわゆる運営側通理事のに女性が占める割合は、えー、全国では3から 6% で、まあ、陶芸部門では 0% でしたで地方組織になるともっと少なくてやはり 0% でしたはいはい Uh, so, all in all, there are more opportunities for women to learn ceramics in educational institutions other than through apprenticeships. But、uh, I conducted a small research about female artists prior to this event, and I'd like to show you the statistics. And the statistics has it that there are only three to six percent of female directors in the board of organizing committees at the national level for such exhibitions as Japan Fine Arts Exhibition, Contemporary Arts and Crafts Exhibition, or traditional crafts associations. And when it comes to the more local organizations or ceramic section, the ratio went down to zero. えー、つまり、まあ、女性は、まあ、個人のフリー作家として組織に入らない。それとも、まあ、入れないのか入らないのか、また自らもそういう選択をしていくっていうのが、あの、多いような気がします。非常に、まあ、大きな問題かなとも思っています。ただ、教育現場にいる女性の作家は少なくはありません。で、専門の陶芸の組織的な世界では、ほとんど問答は開かれていないようなのが現状です。えー、せめて、まあ、40% ぐらいまで男女の比率が上がることを、えー、それによって本当に、まあ、あの公,公正な質、それから活動の幅、まあ、より良い環境とか、それから、まあ、貢献の場が増えていくということを私は期待しています。
I wonder if this is partially because of the general tendencies of female ceramicists being independent artists. I don't know whether they cannot or don't want to enter these organizations, but either way, this is an issue, a huge issue. There are many women ceramicists in the educational fields, but almost zero presence in the traditional organizations on ceramics or pottery. I would like this ratio to go up at least 40%, achieving more equality in quality and opportunities for women, as well as encouraging women to be more active in variety of fields. Um, back to you, Jacqueline. Thank you so much, Hayashi Sensei, for just this very rich response and answer. Um, I think what you are raising is very important um, information and for people to understand that um, Absolutely, there's incredible strides, I think, in the field, but to be able to um, integrate more female representation in these organizations is very much, is a very important thing um, to hopefully also affect change in the future as well, so that more, to open the barriers for more women to enter these organizations. So thank you for sharing that, that information with us. My next question is to uh, Fujikasa-san. Um, many of your American fans have found your work to be incredibly inspirational and evocative. And some have even drawn references to the Venus de Milo at the Louvre and also sculptures by uh, Loy Fuller. And for you, your art education began at a very young age um, with visits to art museums with your mother. Was there any particular artwork that you vividly remember which has continued to inspire you even today as an established artist? Thank you everyone for inviting me to this event. I'm happy to be part of you tonight. えっと、印象に残っているものは本当にたくさんあって、えっと、で、there have been many art pieces that have inspired me and I, it's hard to pinpoint just a few, but if I had to choose, I can still clearly re remember, recall the sensation at the Camille Claude exhibition. Upon entering, uh, encountering her works, something moved me deeply. And I remember going back to the exhibition many times after. Another inspiration, I remember would be the gigantic Egyptian statues that I saw at the British Museum exhibition. The magnitude and the presence overwhelmed me. And now that I think it must have influenced the scale of my works. Those are えっと、え、what I find as a common denominator among the works that I have stayed in my memories is that they let the audience feel human emotions, ego, the rawness of what's inside an individual. Something we tend to overlook in our busy daily lives is brought up to the surface with their works. Uh, え、その
わしがやらねば誰がやるという言葉を残しているんですけれども、えー、とそれは私自身の作家として、えー、制作するあの覚悟として常に心の中に置いています。平久市伝中 is a sculptor that I would name as my influential artist up to now. His motto was if it cannot be done now, then when? If I cannot do it, then who else? As an artist, I aspire to live by his words and always keep them in my heart. Back to you, Jacqueline. Well, thank, I want to say、uh, thank you so much for sharing such influences with us. As you can see, it's, it's so diverse、um, in style and medium. And I think that's, that's so wonderful that you, know, you are being able to connect and draw from these. You know, as you describe the kind of rawness, the ego, the inner, the inner,、um, and to be able to inspire you to create your wonderful sculptures. So, thank you for sharing that.、Um, my next question is for Fudomura san.、Um, your process is very unusual as it uses both stoneware and porcelain to create surfaces that are, evoke images of crusty old bread. Lichen covered logs or water cut logged leather,、um, to name just a few.、Uh, can you tell us how you arrived at this approach and how it has evolved throughout your extensive career? Yes,、uh, hello from Paris. Uh, so, uh, from the beginning,、uh, so I tried to speak in English, so my bad English, I'm sorry. So, from the beginning, I, I love mix、uh, various materials. Into my clay to give some ex expression. So, about the story of my crusty old red、uh, ceramic, that is a family of the collection of this museum.、Uh, this work started with a small mishap. Now I can say it was a good accident. One day I hosted one Japanese artist from Arita in my studio so for three months. He wanted to try French porcelain after he left.、Uh, yeah, this, this family is, yes.、Um, uh, after he left, I found a mountain of dirty, dry porcelain left behind. My studio is a mess. In Japan, we learn clay is alive.、Uh, so we have even a god of clay. To throw it away is not allowed for Japanese artists. After some trial and error, I decided to mix it a lot of mountain of porcelain with my stoneware clay. But until that time, I believed two materials couldn't be mixed to fire because of the huge shrinkage, in a difference of its shrinkage, what we learned in the school. But finally, I could manage it. So,、um, this was the story of my cursed, crusty old bread ceramic. So, this is just one example. I don't completely hate accident, mistake, or catastrophe, or something not allowed to do. From that, I'm sure we can find out something new, anything. So, anyway, this is my way to create something new. And I continue to try various experiments even today. So, well, thank you so much for that answer. And I love the story of just that discovery moment of walking into this dirty studio <laughs> 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 and discovering. But at the same time, you were really creating, you know,、uh, lemonade from lemons, you know, just, just really、um, creating, inspiring to create something new. So, I love that. Thank you so much. My next question is for Joan. Um, so, and I think this is, you know, probably many people are wondering this and thinking about this, especially given your experience of working with these amazing women.、Um, having been involved with the Japanese ceramics community for over three decades, please tell us how you find the work、um, and how do you decide to represent a particular artist? Thank you, Jacqueline.、Um, it's、um, more complicated than it may seem, in part because I live in New York and the artists work in Japan.、Uh, but over 40 years,、uh, my goal has always been to find material 
where the work is immediate and visceral. One does not need a degree in art history. One does not need a background in Chinese ceramic history, but the beauty, the authority, the command of technique and the artistic merits are very immediate to the viewer. The work does not require historical or philosophical reinterpretation. And the artistry of the artist is never ostentatious. It's, it's always, or egotistical, I guess you should say. It begs to be touched. It begs to be held. It begs to be seen from various perspectives. It is tactically irresistible. Uh, and then, of course, it's really good if the, the material is affordable and visually accessible and that one can see it in 360 degrees. So it's really critical uh, for the collector, for the curator or for the dealer to see and handle as much material as possible, the best and the worst. It cannot be done from photos. It cannot be done from displays in museums. Ceramics must be appreciated in the hand to be touched and works by an artist have to be compared within their own oeuvre as well. Uh, after many, many decades of travel in Japan, meeting with artists, hours spent in conversation with them over countless uh, sake, uh, flasks of sake and uh, glasses of beer and holding the works in my hands uh, has proven to be the best education of all. Um, as I said, you cannot judge from a solitary work of art. So one has to sit with an artist, talk about their goals, talk about their technique, discuss their point of view, their training, and to get a sense of where they've come from and what direction they wish to go. So I'm gonna give you six examples of how I have actually met particular artists and where that introduction has led me. But before I leave, here you see a picture of Carol looking at an enormous uh, Akiyama Yo that doesn't look so big, but it, it has now entered the permanent collection of the Osaka Ceramic uh, uh, Toyo uh, Museum in Osaka. And uh, a work below by Koike Shoko, who was already mentioned by Ahashikaku, and then a work known to, I'm sure, most people in the audience by Kondo Takehiro. So next slide. So of the six ways I meet artists, uh, the first is by uh, traveling to lots of galleries, art fairs, museum shows, and the work of Kwase Shinobu is perhaps the most universally recognized in part because of, of Western fascination with Celadon glazing. Uh, and I first found his work in 1983 at the Japan um, Ceramics Today exhibition at the Smithsonian. And I decided I had to meet the man who made that bull. So fortunately, I chose the right way to be introduced to him, which was through a dear friend who was a Chinese ceramics uh, specialist in Tokyo. And that led me to Kikuchi Tomo, who is the Dwight, was the doyen of contemporary Japanese clay. And now after, gosh, since 1984, we're almost working onto a 40 year relationship. We will have our seventh show of his work opening in November. Next slide. The other way you sometimes, or I certainly meet people, is by just serendipity. Uh, living in Tokyo for three years while, while my husband was a uh, running his law firm's office in Tokyo, I would spend my days literally wandering the streets of uh, Shibuya or Ginza. And at Ginza, I encountered a dish store, basically a place to buy gifts uh, for wealthy people. And I like the dishes a lot, but I don't sell dishes. And I asked the artist, a very young man, Sakiyama Takeyuki, does he do anything larger? Well, in those days, he pulled out a folder of Polaroid pictures. Everything looked terrific. And that set me off on an expedition to his home on the Izu Peninsula, which looks a lot like Monterey, California. And uh, we went out to his backyard, took out the garden hose, hosed out the bird's nest and the cat shit that was all over everything, bought a few pieces, one of which ended immediately in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum. And the other that you can see at the top, which um, was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum through the courtesy of Mary Burke.
Uh, since that kind of uh, very instant recognition in America, his works have now been the poster child, as you see, for a big show on contemporary Japanese clay in Paris. He has won the Emperor's Cup. He's the poster child for the Metropolitan Museum. And uh, those who collect his work may have no interest in Japanese clay, but love the work. I get constant email solicitations from architects and hotel designers wanting his work for lobbies in Hong Kong, China, everywhere. So after serendipity, next slide, is sort of um, running into someone at a small gallery. This is where I say I do my due diligence and I'm running around going to five or 10 shows a day looking for new people. So here doing that kind of due diligence, I found this exhibition in a small gallery in Shibuya where this guy was making these little boxes with this glistening glaze. And uh, from that start and then getting the right introduction, uh, we have become lifelong friends. And I'm sure as many of you know, his works have graced the collections of museums all over the globe. In the right, you see a piece in the Musée Guimet. This particular reduction form, which is made from a body cast is now, similar works are in the collections of uh, Minneapolis Institute of Art, Seattle Art Museum, the Asian Art Museum, San Francisco. Um, and I think I'm forgetting some places, but um, a total magician and uh, the Horvitzes are very generously and passionately uh, organizing a show of his work with together with that of his two illustrious forebearers, Kondo Yuzo and Kondo Yutaka and his father Kondo Hiroshi, that will be an exhibition that I believe, if fingers crossed, is going to travel for the next 10 years through museums throughout the United States including the crow. Next slide. Uh, another way uh, is through formal introduction. I was introduced to the works of Koike Shoko through Kukuchi Tomo, who I mentioned to you was the doyen and patroness of contemporary Japanese clay starting in the 1970s and had a gallery in Tokyo called Kandori and actually for a short time had a gallery in Bloomingdale's department store here in New York, which was uh, very seminal to lighting a fire for many of us. So I couldn't have had a better introduction than through Madame Kukuchi, but nevertheless, um, it took a while to work with uh, Koike Sensei to acquire her best pieces that were historical pieces and then to place them in museums collections like the one you see there for the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Next slide. Then there's perseverance. And I can't tell you how hard it was to get not only a foot in the door with Ogawa Machiko, but to actually strike a relationship. And what I didn't know is that Ogawa thought Americans were a bunch of rubes and bumpkins and that we had no appreciation of clay and we were just not worthy of her work. So I went to visit her in the hinterlands of the Izu Peninsula, not once, not twice, three times. The fourth time I said to my husband who was traveling with me that time, I said, okay, this is the last time. I'm gonna give it the fourth time. And the fourth time was the charm because Ogawa speaks impeccable French and she uh, lived in Burkina Faso for a number of years with her anthropologist husband and also studied in Paris. And once my husband opened his mouth speaking equally beautiful French, suddenly we're golden. We had, she brought out a homemade pie. We had not only tea, but coffee. And um, that set us forward with a long uh, relationship and placing music pieces in many museums collections. And we will have our fourth show of her next year. And finally, the other way I meet artists is through introductions from artists themselves. Uh, Ide Hirihito was introduced to me by Fukami Suehara, a great uh, Celadon artist and sculptor who picked him as the prize winner in 1999 and said, you gotta go meet this guy. And then Tanaka Yu, who was introduced to me by Kondo Takahiro himself, uh, when she was awarded a prize by him uh, more recently. And we've been putting her pieces in uh, important collections really quickly for a very young junior artist. So there you have my roadmap, everyone. Good luck. And uh, I wish you um, 
great courage in trying to uh, navigate this rocky terrain. Thank you. That was fantastic, Joan. Thank you so much for sharing so generously. Um, I love this story of having to go back several, several times. Yes. <laughs> what a great story. Um, but it seems like it worked and it seemed it like, yeah, <laughs> it seemed like you've been successful. Um, I would love to turn uh, my next questions to Carol and Jeffrey Horvitz, who have so generously uh, been so supportive of this exhibition um, with their amazing collection, speaking from from the gallerist perspective and also to the collector's perspective. Um, Carol, I think, you know, we've worked together quite a, a bit um, and, you know, you have been so, in, um, so much a part of arranging and producing so many traveling exhibitions um, at several museum venues. Um, how did we, how did you decide to create this sort of special exhibition? And why did you feel it was important to focus on this particular group of women artists of the many, many that are represented in your collection? So I think I have my, yeah, I mute off then. Oh, perfect, so, yeah. So I think the the pictures, you know, in a, in a um, quick answer would be the, the photos speak for themselves. And seeing the pieces, I mean, I I will add more to that, but you see these photos and these pieces are just crying out for attention. Like Joan had said, you don't need to have any special background knowledge. They just speak to you and they did that to me. So um, and Jeffrey and I have collected other things in our lifetime. And uh, I think the Japanese collection they started around 2008. And uh, we developed a philosophy for our collection. One of the parts of the philosophy or the, the um, parameters, whatever you want to call it, was it had to be serious because we were collecting to lend and we were thinking of the museums and what would display. And so it had to be serious. So in 2008, with this goal in mind, we started our purchasing and we consciously looked you know, to purchase subsets thinking, you know, of museums can't possibly show 1500 pieces at one time, but maybe there will be one eventually, I'm not sure. So we, we tried to put it into subsets. And one of the subset was single artists, uh, uh, family groups, young artists, emerging artists, living national treasures, um, and of course, women artists. And so we weren't buying just what we liked, although we got, a, we got away with a few of those, quite a few. Uh, so it's been over a decade um, since two fabulous shows were put together. Joan mentioned them earlier. The uh, Touch Fire, which started at Smith, and I believe was believe was single venue. I think that it was about 15 years ago. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then Soaring Voices, which I believe Joan started in Paris. Is that right? It, at least 15 years ago, right? Yeah. It started in Japan. Okay, sorry. It's okay. So it went to four or 11 venues at least, if not more. And I think it's been about 15 years for that. And it all came together with the Crow, with this fabulous venue and with Jacqueline and just this wonderful um, audience in Dallas. It was what I call my legal profession, a no brainer. So here we go. Yes, I, I think it was absolutely a no brainer. And it's true, we, you know, there really hasn't, uh, from, from when we, we discussed this in the last program as well, just the fact that there actually hasn't, it's been a long time since there had been a, a, a show dedicated to featuring only all women, uh, female ceramicists. So I think this was really important for us to do and it's timely. Um, and I, my next question is to Jeffrey actually as well. Um, and, you know, and Carol, please feel free to speak to it as well. But you know, owning probably this large collect, the largest collection of modern and contemporary Japanese ceramics, public or private, outside of Japan, mm -hmm. how do you see the collection evolving in the years ahead? Uh, it depends how long I live, but uh, it's not actually the largest collection we have. The largest, actually, the French Old Master collection, with about two thousand objects of seventeen hundred drawings, two hundred paintings. 35 sculptures from 1600 to about 1850. So, uh, so that actually uh, preceded this collection. So we had some experience and we had experience with a smaller but important collection of Chinese cinnabar lacquer, which we started in uh, the mid 1990s, uh, which is mostly from the Imperial Workshop. 
mostly Ming and Qing period. And it, it takes quite a lot of organization. There's a full-time curator for the, who's actually one of the top experts in the country for the French collection. And uh, the Japanese collection is handled almost exclusively by Carol. My role in it is um, with the shared passion is really purchasing and some amount of strategy. But she actually virtually alone manages to handle this uh, extraordinarily complex set of uh, museum relationships and the works of art. The only other function I have is that when the gallery space of about 1500 square feet needs rearranging for things going in and out, uh, I do that. It's actually a pleasure, but it takes about five hours on average and the last go around was seven. It's actually a lot of fun for me. So the, the strategy of the future is not going to be wildly changed. Uh, the major factors will be, we want to acquire really superb pieces by established artists. We want to support by purchase and by museum display, significant examples by promising younger and mid-career artists. And uh, Fujikaso Satoko is a perfect example. Um, she's still young, but she was younger when we first saw her work and only a couple of years older when we actually got to meet her. And in, in her case, what had happened was, we, as Joan explained, we were sent up to see this exhibition and to, I stopped dead in my tracks at the door without even going in, looking at this, and simply turned to Joan and said, are these for sale? Of course, American museums don't have selling exhibitions. She said, I will find out, and she did. And I said, before she went to find out, there were four large uh, pieces right at the entrance. And I said, if these are for sale, we'll take one or two. I didn't even ask the price. And then the various members of the group, I think each bought about one piece. And so we waited for that. And then we bought most, a large share at least of what remained. It was either six, somewhere between six and nine pieces. And those pieces never came home. They were never intended to come home. They were intended to go immediately to American museums as gifts. And the point of this was that both Carol and I saw what we thought was probably an unknown genius. There was no assurance that this would continue, but I talked about this as thinking if there were a MacArthur Prize for ceramics, she would get it. Fortunately, she certainly uh, not only met the expectation, but exceeded it in her work. So that it was probably the most perfect example of our interest in providing support, both by purchase, but also by distribution to American museums of uh, younger artists in particular. We will continue to distribute pieces around to American uh, and maybe European museums for the general public. Major factor for us is lots of people seeing it. And when I talk about lots of people, Carol's last estimate was it can't be less than half a million people who would not otherwise have seen Japanese modern contemporary ceramics. Uh, to do this, we use a mixture, I should say Carol does, of loans, gifts, and exhibitions. Uh, sometimes the exhibitions are actually traveling in parallel. In other words, there's more than one exhibition moving at a time. We'll continue to put extra effort into promoting women artists, uh, which is how we started with museums. It actually started as a focus with the Harn Museum at the University of Florida. Uh, we actually, uh, I'd rather, actually had done this already in the French collection. Uh, clearly the women artists were not alive, but I saw a gap in museum representation of French uh, women artists of 17th, which are very few, 18th, somewhat more, and a fairly good number in the 19th century. 
So we'll continue to focus on filling gaps and particularly acquiring major examples of earlier masters, Rosanjan, Kawanashoji, Kawe Kanjiro, Arakawa Toyozo, Tomoto Kenkichi, et cetera. If we get very lucky, we might get a, uh, maybe would get an example by a Taya Hazan. So uh, we will add to our existing holdings of excellent examples of major artists like living national treasures, but some of the most major artists in the past have actually turned down the designation. And what we're trying to achieve there is more breadth and depth of the most significant artist in their most significant styles. Now, as much room as we have in the house, we do need to make loans and gifts to reduce the totals, but the gifts are part of a permanent activity. I can refer to my wife as sort of the Johnny Appleseed of Japanese ceramics. She spreads them around hoping that by having them in permanent collections, it will stimulate a continuation of our efforts by others. We'll also have more exhibitions with catalogs. And uh, we're fairly adept at that from the French experience and Carol's experience. And the catalogs need to be sometimes not so grand because the price point to distribute to a large audience uh, has to be more reasonable. But there will be serious catalogs, good photos, essays, and we'll try to expand the scholarly aspect of the catalogs. We'll continue with simultaneous exhibitions. You almost can't have too much. Uh, and we will have to, we'll try to make a plan for the long term, beyond our lifetimes, to keep Japanese contemporary ceramics, and contemporary will be a moving target, in the public eye here and in Europe, and hoping that, uh, that in Japan, that will also stimulate interest in those artists who don't have a strong following or strong market yet in Japan. So pretty much it'll be business as usual, but hopefully more and better. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was for this really rich and in-depth answer. I think that I think that the attention that both you and, and Carol have yeah. paid to to creating this collection, this phenomenal collection, really speaks to you know your um, just it, the way that you've been collecting is incredibly intellectual. It's incredibly passionate. It's incredibly generous, um, and I think it it will only enhance the field even further by the fact that you're so generously lending um, and sharing the collection with the world. So thank you, thank you very much. Exactly, and I'll say one quick thing. Yeah, it's also a function of the uh, American museums, which mm -hmm. have have been absorbing these works of art and you know for as long as Joan has been in the field at least and I mean much shorter for me and the museums are still absorbing it so there's a great hunger or as Joan um, called it the allure yeah allure of Absolutely. yeah no that's perfectly stated it's true I think there is a hunger for this type of content um, not being able and especially right now it's not always accessible so having your collection is so important especially for us here in the US. <laughs> yeah. well, one of the other features of, about this has probably a little more to do with me than with Carol for change. Um, we try to, in different ways, engage the public in a more vernacular language. So it doesn't seem so inaccessible and so distant. And to be able to articulate why we were attracted to something in a way that helps them to see. Uh, one of the things I had experience with was teaching the Tufts University French art history class, not about the facts of the works, but how to look at them. And so the, the pieces of the artists that you have on the panel to be a, a sort of clear why we would be interested. So with Futamura, these are works that are very tactile. They're actually rather mysterious, sometimes even foreboding in their beautiful way. Sometimes you wonder, do you really want to put your hand inside? What would be inside? And for Hayashi, you have this great sense of power, of movement, of strength, things that are extruding, that they're moving. And with Fujikasa, you have this very elegant, billowing, fabric-like 
use of ceramics where the ceramic doesn't have much meaning except that it stabilizes it, stabilizes uh, the three-dimensional imagery like a snapshot in time. She's caught the movement right there. And to be able to explain more about how to look, and Joan mentioned something in, about this also, that you don't need to be an art historian. You don't need to know a whole lot of facts. And that may explain why the public, based on visitor comments, seems to immediately get enough of it to want to come back and back and back. I think it's perfectly said. Thank you so much. I would love to, um, I think we've, we mentioned this earlier, actually, um, in the beginning of the, pan, of the, converse, of the program, um, which was that, and Joan mentioned this as well as Amy, and I think, I think everyone has sort of alluded to this, which is that connection to nature um, that I think all three of the artists have um, and, or are evoking nature in some way um, in their works. And so I'd love to ask, uh, returning back to the artists, I would love to ask my next question to Hayashi Sensei. The environment has played a key source of inspiration for your oeuvre. And in addition, you have participated in numerous environmental projects. Can you tell of us of just a few of your sources of inspiration and how they have been integrated into your work? え、私が住んでいるところはま、そう遠くないところにま標高 あの、<笑> 自分の身を置いてで、ま、Sorry, there's Kegon waterfall not too far from where I live. It's located at the 2000 meter above sea level with a vertical drop of 100 meter. It always reminds me how powerful nature can be beyond my imagination and how it has always been looked up to by our ancestors with a sense of awe and admiration. I always put myself in the middle of the vast nature, close my eyes and listen to the sound of waterfall with my entire body, trying to get a solid sense of massive tidal waves going through me. These physical sensations gave rise to my works such as Zero Series, Kegon Series and Ocean Series, all of which I consider as my life work. ま、always and could only pay respect and pray in front of the energy and the truth nature and the universe present us. お願いします。特に東日本大震災後に制作した海の
あの湧き上がってくる生命としてガラス玉も組み込みました。The Ocean Series that I, that I started working on after the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami was an homage to the ocean as well as a requiem for the lost souls. I also wanted to represent a sense of hope. Incorporate a sense of hope, and the glass balls were incorporated as the symbol of life proliferating. どうぞ。えー、あの、塔の作品を制作することは、まあ、自然そのものや、まあ、地球を。や、あ、地球科学を学ぶようなものだと思っています。で、地球の中心に、まあ、マグマがあって、その外側に。マントルがありますでそのマントルの温度は地表の近くでは600度で深いところで1300度、まあ、焼き物の小生温度と同じですで,ですから地球を科学することは実に興味深いです For me? Creating earthenware is like learning about the nature of the science of the earth. At the core of the earth, there is magma surrounded by the mantle, of which temperature varies from 600 Celsius, which is 1,100 Fahrenheit near the earth's surface, to the 1,300 Celsius, which is 2,300 Fahrenheit towards the core, which are exactly the same as the variation of the firing temperature, which is fascinating. えー、石は、まあ、地球が作った塔であって、まあ、塔は人間が作った生まれたての石であると私は子どもたちに焼き物を理解し,理解してもらうときにそう伝えていますそしてまあ一度焼かれたものっていうのは二度と土に戻らないのです塔の歴史は人類の歴史そのものだと、まあ、子どもたちに教えています That's why I teach children at the pottery class that、uh, stones are pottery created by the earth, and the pottery is the newborn stone made by humans. And that、um, also, that once ceramics are made, it will no longer go back to the soil. The history of the pottery is that of human species. That's all. 鼓動そのすべてを感じ取って土で形にしていく試みは、まあ、自由に展開したいと思っていますで作品にしていくことしかできないのですが、まあ、世界中がコロナに翻弄されている今だからこそ、まあ、強くて不動の何かを形にしていきたいと願っています、まあ、地球温暖化コロナそして人類に突きつけられている問題は、まあ、山積しています Capturing the dynamism and the heartbeat of nature and giving it forms, utilizing the clay as medium, is something I like to keep exploring without boundaries. Creation is the only thing I can do, and the world is upside down in the midst of the pandemic. And I want to create something that people can hold on to, especially more than ever. We are faced with many issues such as climate change and the current pandemic, and each time we are reminded how powerless we are. お願いします、はいえー、人類と同じだけの歴史がある塔は、土、石、火を使って、まあ、未来を英語、人類の生きた証を残し続けてきました。人間の性は長い歴史の中の一瞬でしかないのでもっといろいろな表現にこれからも挑戦していけたらと思っています。Yet, the clay art, which is the product of earth, stone and fire, is the proof of the entire human history since its inception. One human life is a mere fraction of the entire history, and that fact only drives me to challenge myself to further. My expressions. Thank you. Back to you, Jacqueline. Thank you very much、uh, for your answer,、um, Hayashi Sensei. I, I love this image that comes to mind when, with what you said about how stones are the pottery of the earth. 
um, the, that's the creation of the earth itself. So I love that imagery um, and that connection. So thank you very much. It's a very beautiful analogy. My next question is to Futamura san uh, Nature is an extremely important part of your oeuvre as evident in the titles of your works, which cite roots, uh, rhizomes, ice, nests, and waves. Can you tell us how you came to this vocabulary and why? Uh, yes, uh, so about the nature. So yes, I created also many works around the nature. Uh, I think the main reason is that for it's my background. Uh, I was born in Japan and got my education there. As you know, in Japan, we have Shintoism, like original religion, uh, it's animist. I don't practice any religion, but we can't escape in Japan from this idea in the daily life. So I got a kind of uh, sensibility uh, from that uh, for the uh, nature, I think. And now I'm living in a big city, Paris, the, uh, uh, far from my hometown, Nagoya. Maybe I think more about the nature from the city. And also I think about uh, Japanese culture from the outside of Japan. Uh, so this is my explanation about the nature. And then do you know, uh, also uh, 2011, earthquake and the tsunami and the accident of Fukushima. Uh, this gave for me also a big impact on me. Uh, the fear of losing something. At that time, I thought if we lost everything in Japan. I felt helpless and impatient with myself. It was in, in this context, context, my new work, Black Hole and Divorce, was born, were born. So from this time, I started to uh, include some social message in my work. I think that's, I, I'm, I think that's fantastic. Um, I'm so interested in, in um, some of the new work that you're doing. Um, you're talking, especially during this time of COVID, um, especially with those recent environmental disasters. Um, and I can see that influence absolutely um, could, you know, how it's affecting, I think many artists um, and their, and their thinking. So it'd be, very interest, it'd be very interesting to see what comes next. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My next question is to Afujikasa-san. The titles of your work also frequently express movement in nature, like flowing, blossoming, soaring. Um, clearly you're trying to capture this sense of dynamism um, within each work. How does your creative process lead you to this? And how do you convey this in your gravity-defying sculptures? Can you take us through this process from concept to completion? えっと、the creative process of these forms is very somatic. Whenever I find things that intrigue me, which can be things I feel in my day, と
とこう体を腕で締め付けるようなものを体現してみるとか、えー、表現したいものをまず体にこう染み込ませる、えー、そういうことをやっていって、えー、作りたいフォルムのイメージを、えー、具体的にこう頭に思い描きやすくなって。でそのようなことを繰り返していくうちに、えー、断片的にこうちょっとずつ思いついていった形がある日こうカチカチっとこうパズルのように組み合わさって、えー、実際に、えー、一つの形のイメージがこう出来上がってきます。あ、oh, sorry, repeat, repeating again. The creative process of these forms is very somatic. Whenever I find things that intrigue me, which can be things I see. Feel in my daily life, I first try to express that form with my body. I could stretch my arm to re enact a branch sprawling up, or I could try to express the flow of wind with my body. When it comes to emotions, I would, for example, coil my arms around my body tight to feel the suffocating emotions. Or there are sensations that I want to express in my works, and I let them sink into my body to the visceral level. Doing so makes it easier for me to envision the form in details. By repeating this process, one day, one day fragments of shapes that had come to my mind previously all come together like pieces of jigsaw puzzle, and then an entire image of the whole completes. えー、とイメージをこう体に染み込ませておくと実際にこう制作するときに、えー、指先から粘土に伝わるように思います。えー、これは粘土という素材がこう押,す押すとか、えー、つまむとか握る、えー、そういった作用に対して素直に反応してくれる素材だからこそだと思っています。Another benefit of letting these images sink into my body is that the sensations seem to transmit better from my fingers to the clay. This is probably thanks to the susceptible nature of clay. It takes in every action that's been made on, such as pressing, Pinching and grabbing. 私の作品は手び,のり手びねりの中でも粘土の紐を一段一段積み上げていく紐作りという技法で制作しているんですけれどもこの陶芸独特の柔らかい粘土を下からどんどんどんどん積み上げて形を作るという行為は粘土の厚みや硬さなどのバランスを取りながらあ作っているものがこう崩れ落ちないように作るという、えー、重力の戦いのようなものだと思っています。A bit like fighting against gravity, coil building is my method. I take a string of clay and layer one, one, one on top of another. And I think this creative process is unique to pottery making. And it is a constant fight against the gravity. We take soft clay and stack them from bottom. To create a shape while balancing its thickness and hardness so that the working material will not collapse. どのようにして重力に逆らうような彫刻に反映するのかということなんですけれども、地上に存在するものはすべて重力に逆らって存在しているので、そこからこうインスピレーションを受けて要素を取り入れると。えー、イメージする形は自分でも気づかないうちに、えー、自然と重力に逆らうようなものになっています。でさらに、えー、粘土で形を作るという先ほど言った重力との戦いは、えー、土との対話によって器以外のさまざまな形に、えー、発展できると考えていてその考えのもとで、えー、自分のイメージする形と粘土の特性をこう融合させると不思議と重力に逆らうような造形が出来上がります。So if I'm asked how I create gravity-defying sculptures, I would say that every existing being on the earth is defying gravity. And I take inspiration and incorporate elements from them, naturally resulting in the forms that are against gravity without me even intending to. To add more, I believe clay works, which are born of a fight against the gravity, can be transcended into diverse shapes other than vessels, as long as they are created through conversation with the clay. With this in my mind, 
I merge my image of forms with a unique quality of clay, and it mysteriously lands on these gravity-defined sculptures.え、作る場合、初めのイメージ、As for my overall creative process, I wait for the vision of my works to settle in me, as I talked earlier on. Then I sketch the image and make maquettes based on the image and move on to the actual pro production. I build coils of clay from the bottom to make a general shape and give adjustments by adding and scraping off to uh, towards the completion. It roughly takes half a year to create the works especially the ones that shown at this exhibition and with slight variation depending on the sizes and shapes. When one work is created over such a stretch of time, I feel it is very important to be able to hold on to the initial vision and to have a firm understanding of characteristics of the clay as a material, knowing how hard it should be, the speed of drying and also the nature of the clay itself, which leads to the completion of the vision. Back to you, Jacqueline. Thank you, uh, Fujikasa-san, for your answer. And you know, your your answer really does remind us all about, I think, the physicality of the work of 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 creating the physical um, commitment that it takes to make these pieces um, and how long it takes. Um, the really, you know, how you're feeling the inspiration from the your body and touch. Um, so I think this is something that, you know, seeing the pieces, you realize the the work. Um, that you that you put in um, as an artist. So I'm always thrilled um, by learning more about your process. Thank you. Well, I would thank you all so much for these amazing um, presentations of images and information. And we would like to turn, um, if there's time, uh, to open audience Q and A uh, for those of us who are still with us. And we also have. Uh, we received some wonderful questions um, from the audience, and I would love to. Uh, turn the mic or give the mic um, to Joan, who will be moderating the Q&A. Terrific. Uh, thank you, everyone. That was incredibly illuminating and I think persuasive as to the depth of uh, artistic endeavor that all of you are committed to and that we enjoy. We, we've had a couple really terrific questions. The first one that came in, so I'm going to start with that is from Laura Allen, who's the curator of Japanese art at the Asian Art Museum, San Francisco. And this question is for Hayashi Sensei. Uh, in particular, what do you think would be the most helpful to make it possible for more women to practice within traditional pottery centers and workshops? Meaning, uh, not universities, but places like Mashiko or Hagi or Gifu, Mino or Shigaraki. Hey, 
。えー、で大学でも、まあ、女性のアーティストこうたくさんいました。でもまあ普通の例えば日本では産地って呼んでるんですけど産地ので女性の人たちがまず自らの意識もきちんと持たないと、あのー、ダメだなっていうふうには思ってます。だからあの、そうですね、どんな方法っていうと、うん、彼,彼女たちを評価していくのにあの、評価していく人たちがいるっていうのは、まず今回みたいなこのようなあのチャレンジとか、それからこの、えー、美術館のとか、それからあのホロビツご夫妻の、まあ、動きとか、いろんな意味で今は逆にアメリカから日本に刺激を与えているような気がするんですね。ですから時間はかかるかもしれないんですけど、まあ、今例えばここにおられる藤笠さんそして二村さんあの両先生の,あの活躍はもちろんなんですけど本当にごくごく普通の女性の人たちっていうのはもうたくさんいるんですね。ものすごくたくさんいるんです。で、その人たちが、えー、なんか生かされるためには、やはり、なんか、まずは日本の男性も変わらなきゃいけないのかなっていうふうな気がします。えー、まあ今、ジョンさんが私に求めてる答えがちょっともしかしたら違ってるかもしれないんですけど私は中では女性自身の意識そして男性の方の意識の両方が変わっていかなければ、まあ、変化はないだろうなっていうふうに思います、うん、ごめんなさいな、so、this, so this may not be a direct answer to the question but I will try to answer so I might be the oldest among all these three here and I've seen many female artists in educational fields but when it comes to what we call as sanchi which is local kilns、um, I think first of all women's conscious has to change as well female artist conscious needs to change and we look at this opportunity today we are having、uh, look at John's works Hobbit's Carol and Jeffrey's works, and also museums incorporating from America's side. Japan is getting inspired by what America has been telling us. And this, we are to see this recognition that female artists are getting from abroad. It, it is inspiring to us on the Japan side. And not to mention these amazing works done by these two amazing artists, Fujikasa Sensei and Futamura Sensei. There are many, many ordinary women in Japan. And how do we let them shine? We have to, I guess, as well as women have to change, men's consciousness needs to change. And through this changing, only through changing mindset from both sides, we can bring, out, bring about the changes. Thank you. Thank you.、Um, it's, a, it's a difficult road. It, it, in many ways, you are booking、um, a thousand years of tradition、uh, to gain women access as traditional apprentices.、Um, and there was a related question、um, how do, from, that came from Australia. What is the way forward for women artists to be included at the top as critics and judges of arts organizations? Um, I open that、um, maybe for Hayashi and maybe Fujikasa. Futamura, you're mostly in Paris, so maybe you're a little out of the loop with that question. Fujikasa, do you have some thoughts about that? How do we get more women judges in the Nihon Dental Koge or Toge Ten or any of those organizations which become the arbiters, the judges of taste? えー、っと伝統工芸であるとか何かこうコンペティションに参加して賞を取るっていうことに対して、えー、それはやっぱり男性女性もちろん、えー、作家の割合として関係しているかもしれないんですがまずはやっぱり、うん、多くの人に訴えかける力のある作品をやっぱり作家が作らなければいけないということ、えー、そういった中でまず女性として私はそのあまり
私自身がその男性社会でそこに飛び込んでいくという意識を持ってコンペに参加するというわけではなくとにかくいいものを作りたいいいものを見せたいいいものを出品したいそういうふうなあの強い意志を持ってまず、えー、出品するそこが根本に、えー、まず第一前提としてあるんじゃないかなと思いますだからあの女性であるとか男性であるとか、うん、そういうことをあまり逆に今はもう意識をせずに思い切ったものを自分をアピールどうアピールするのかどうアピールできる作品を出品できるかその辺が、えー、重要になってくるんじゃないかなと思ってます。So this could be the simple ratio within a traditional craft society which is tend to be male dominant. But as for me, as an individual artist, female artist, I think every work needs to appeal to the audience, needs to be to the viewers, and the scale of work has to speak to them, as it's been talked about in this discussion earlier on. And I myself don't see as myself as a female artist going into this male dominant competition. I just want to create a work that speaks to people, that has an impact on people, and that is just so I. I myself don't really think of gender as part of, you know, as a part of the process of creation. I just want my works to appeal to the audience. That's the end. And as a creator, that has to be the initial intention anytime. Thank you. Thank you. We still have to change the system somehow,、uh, not to speak of the Japanese government as an entity. Too, too difficult to go there. Thank you. Thank you, Fuchika san.、Uh, next question is for y- Yoshimi san.、Um, actually, there's two questions that are sort of related.、Um, we've, we have a lot of interest from Australia tonight.、Um, the question is what, this is from one artist in Australia to you. What gives you the most pleasure, the most joy in creating works? And He also says he is a very messy studio too. So he relates to your story about the messy studio.、Um, and someone else is asking, it's a related question.、Um, speaking of messy and combined,、um, for you, you work with both stoneware and porcelain in the same work. And she, they really want to know how you were able to get those two materials to work well together. Yes, she was、uh, Yes. The first question, I, I can't so understand about Massey. What is Massey? What, what gives you pleasure in creation? Pleasure. Well, my creation.、Mm. <laughs> so when I open the door of、uh, Kirun, if it's just I wanted, to,、uh, I expected or Little bit more, that is big pleasure for me. That is the, the piece、uh, behind of you, it was the case. It was better than I created. <laughs> And、uh, second one is、uh, what is the second one? Working with both, when you work with both stoneware and porcelain, yeah, yeah. how do you w e d g e them、uh, together and make them happen? That is,、uh, d e p e n d on the quality of porcelain, I think, that you are clay,、uh, but you have to test. That's only the, the way to do. You can do, you know, just mix and you have, you have to do test. That is the only the, the way to do. I can't explain more. Thank you. Partially, a s we as the viewers also have to touch and feel and feel that coexistence between these two diverse mediums, which is quite wonderful.、Yeah. Uh, Carol, uh, next question for you,、uh, also from Australia, is、um, Have you encountered the work of artists that you were not immediately drawn to, but you've gone back to their work later and found their work compelling? Have you changed your opinion on someone from your first initial encounter with their work? 
Absolutely, yes, but none of the people on this. Uh, <laughs> Jeffrey could probably better answer that question, but absolutely yes for me. There's some that I just walked away from and you know didn't look back. And then Jeffrey can probably tell you why he, I, we look back. Did you hear the question, Jeffrey? Yeah. Um, sometimes it's simply which pieces we first saw. So it's not necessarily the whole work of the artist. It's just what we saw. We, we had a policy early on when we very first started that we would not collect much, if any, figurative works. And we stayed with that for a reasonable amount of time. It wasn't that we would never do it, but we would put it off. We also um, decided early on we would not collect things in the aesthetic uh, for lack of a better way to explain it, like Murakami in ceramic work. But that also changes somewhat. And particularly, we wouldn't collect any tea bowls at all because we at least had enough sense to know that we knew absolutely nothing of importance about them. Now we have something like 150 of them, something like that. So, and I think it's useful to revisit artists that other people think are really good and you're not seeing it yet. You may still keep your opinion, but it's worth revisiting that. When I was a young art dealer, yes, I was a young art dealer. I was both young and an art dealer in the 1970s in Los Angeles with uh, primarily uh, American and European art from about the late 19th century to then contemporary. And there were some artists I had a lot of trouble with. And eventually I got to understand it. And um, now I like them. And the same thing is true here. Uh, and my advice to my clients then, which we more or less follow to this day, I depict it as a Venn diagram. In set theory, they're the circles, the set of something and the set of another thing and the set of another thing. And there's the set of all the things that you like. There's the set of, of all the art that you like. There's the set of all the art that knowledgeable people in the field connoisseurs like, I think is very good. And there's the set of all the things that are at least priced reasonably for what they are. And I told all my clients who should buy the intersection of those three sets, which is a lot smaller than any one of the sets. And we follow that principle today. There's also, however, things that we bought because we like them. And later on, we don't dislike them, but by comparison now in our deeper understanding, we can see they're good, but they're not great. Not everything we have to have has to be great. And so you start to think about what changed? What, what's the deeper understanding that now you can see? And often it's simply by comparison. You really don't know what good art is if you don't see not very good art. And you don't understand what great art is unless you see what good art is. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to see a lot of art to start to get that understanding. And it helps to have some guidance from other people. Joan has been our major guidance. And others have helped too. And we sometimes have disagreements, even with Joan. Joan and I have about a 95% overlap in what we think is really good. Uh, Carol and therefore and Joan and I have about an 85% overlap. She likes things that I describe as goopier. So things that have a lot of stuff on them, a lot of activity. And uh, if you think in Chinese terms, which is easier to explain it generally, she likes particularly the Qing period and I like the Tang and Song period. Somehow we managed to coexist together. But in a nutshell, I've never made a mistake, have I? <laughs> Not at all, Ooh. except Mary May. But <laughs> so we probably should go on. Joan, were there very many yeah. more questions? Yeah. Oh, you're muted, Joan. Thank you, thank you. We're running close to two hours. So we have one question uh, left for Fujikasa. 
Uh, but I do want to say, uh, Jeffrey and Carol, that part of the dilemma is watching artists mature. So when you invest uh, both financially in terms of real estate in your uh, capacious space and you invest in a young artist, you don't necessarily know where that artist is going to go. Uh, sometimes they get better. Occasionally they get worse. Hopefully we work together to assure that their work gets better and better. But sometimes a juvenilia, what becomes juvenilia is not as successful as what comes later. But um, when you're uh, encyclopedic collectors like yourselves, having early work by an artist is equally important to having mature works. So uh, the last question, because we are running out of time, is for Fujikasa-san. And uh, actually, it's a good way to end because it's about tea ceremony. And as you may remember, I showed you an example of her work in a tea room for the Hagi Uragami Museum. Um, although when you look at work, one does not think of her as a tea ceremony artist. So um, and let me get back to this question. Um, so the question is, is really for you, Fujikasa-san, what do you think about contemporary tea ceremony and creating utensils of new forms and new aesthetics? And how obviously you feel your work can be included in this very ritualistic event or ritualistic practice in Japan? Or can it only be seen in museums? うんと、まずお茶の世界というのはなかなかこう敷き取り、敷きたりというかあのルール作法というものがたくさんあって、えっと決められたことというのが非常に多いです。え、作品というものもその茶室というものに合わせて作られる。その茶室の独特の空間に
Um, if we have missed a few of these questions, haven't had time for, I'm sure we'll endeavor to get back to you um, in a written form by email. So I turn the floor back over to Jacqueline to tie this up. Thank you so much, Joan. Thank you for moderating this question and answer session. Um, I'd like to actually pass the mic even further along <laughs> to Amy, our director for closing remarks. Thank you. Yes. I wanna thank uh, this room and especially our panelists. Uh, Joan, you've done a beautiful job um, tying this all together for us as beautifully as, as what we saw in those acrylic boxes. Uh, Fuji Kasa-san, thank you very much for your beautiful answers to our questions. Futamura-san, thank you for staying up late in Paris and <laughs> being with us in the middle of the night. Yoshizawa-san, thank you very much for um, helping us translate these beautiful words. And of course, um, I am ha Hayashi <laughs> Sensei, thank you very much for showing us uh, your mastery, really sharing your gifts. Jeffrey-san, Carol-san, thank you. Bonnie-san and to the team in the gallery in New York. We're so thankful for all that you've uh, created in this program with us to our friends of the Japan America Society. We are grateful. And all of you today have taught us that pottery is the newborn stone. Nature is our teacher to listen to the waterfall with your whole body and that the tidal waves of the ocean can move through us. Every being on this earth is defying gravity. You've taught us, shown us how to draw the inside out from within. And you've made us all feel better when you told us that your studio, like mine, is a mess. <laughs> you've shown us how you've seen the clay take on every action that's been made upon it. And now we, with you and all of those here in the global community, um, are part of that action too. Jeffrey and Carol, you've enchanted us with your commitment to take unknown genius to known genius and show us, shown us how you can stretch this gift into the future beyond our lifetimes. And when you know, you know that it is, as Carol says, a no brainer. Carol, I'll not, never forget, is the Johnny Appleseed of Japanese ceramics. Jeffrey wants to show artists in clay that wants and wants all of you, Jeffrey and Carol, want to show artists in clay just as I do and want all of you to come back and back and back. And we, the Crow Museum, the Joan Mervis Gallery, want you to come back too. So let this uh, conversation continue into the future. Thank you for your generosity of time and love and spirit and we will gather again soon. Thank you and good night and good morning.